Thank you very much, Aveline, for working with me to be able to come here this evening. Thank you to everybody for being here. I appreciate you. Um, happy Black History Month. Um, so that I can get a sense of who's in the room, uh, this is QP79. So what do y'all do? Give me some examples. Who, yeah, I know that. <laughs> But let's get specific now, like shelters. Shelters. Okay, what else is going on here? Social services, housing, buildings, public health, court services, hospitals, healthcare, recreation. So, okay. Social services. I hope. I hope that. Um, I hope that I'm, what I'm about to say has, you know, um, a little bit of a relevance for everybody in the different work that you're doing, the important work that everybody here is doing on behalf of and for the betterment of the city of Toronto, right? Um, I, I, I came in on my own African time this evening, so I <laughs> missed whether or not you guys gave uh, a land acknowledgement, but even if you did, um, I want to give one myself uh, because I'm proud to be standing here in front of you. It is a privilege to be here. I was born not on this territory. I was actually born in, I learned recently, uh, Treaty 7 territory, which is in Alberta. Treaty 7 is the boundary, the northern boundary is the Red Deer River, and I was actually born in Red Deer, Alberta. Um, but the reason I actually want to give a little bit of an extended land acknowledgement is because the teachings that I've been receiving around land acknowledgements are that we have to personalize them, number one, and they have to be about action. They can't just be about saying that we are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, of the Mohawk, of the Huron-Wendat. We can't end there. We know we're here. That's, right. That's not enough, though. Mm -hmm. So let me explain what that means for me personally. I was born in Red Deer, Alberta, but my parents are from Sierra Leone, from Freetown, Sierra Leone in West Africa. So let's talk about our history now. Freetown is so named because of its history. Some of you are nodding, and I know you know that history. After British uh, invasion, colonialism, disruption in Western Africa, and the, the theft of our people, mm -hmm. the theft of our people, many of whom never survived the passage, right? People went to the Caribbean. People went to the United States. People went to England from our parts of West Africa, those who survived. And in the case of where my background uh, is, like where my family history came from, we are called the Creole people of Sierra Leone. And the Creole people are interesting because after the failed projects of enslavement in the places that I just mentioned, after black people, some of us, began to claim some more autonomy over some parts of our lives, it was possible for some of us to get out of the places that we had been stolen and taken to. And so Maroons from Jamaica, uh, and people, black people from England, but also, and many don't know this, black people from Nova Scotia, they ended up leaving. Nova Scotia is interesting because black loyalists, as they're called, they fought against the Americans in the American Revolution. And one of the tactics that the British had was to go to enslaved African people and to say, hey, come fight on our side against your captors, against your masters. And if you do that, We'll take you back up to our place up north, and you'll have land, and you'll have food, and you'll have freedom. Now, the British lied about all of that, of course, but that's history. 
because they lied and because when thousands of black loyalists did fight with them in the American Revolution and did come up to what is now Nova Scotia and because the Nova Scotians tried to reproduce many of the racisms and the enslavements even and the indentured servitude that black people had faced in America Many of them said, we have to get out of here. We have to go. And the British were starting to get scared in England, in Jamaica, in Nova Scotia, that there was going to be a big rebellion of black people, because they know how we are. <laughs> so they let some of us leave. And those travelers came back and founded a place called Free Town, which is where my parents were both born, which is where my grandparents were born. So I like to think of it possibly in terms of the Nova Scotia part, that this is my ancestry's second tour around. Yeah. And I would have loved to have learned that in school. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's an important thing that we don't get to learn a lot of the time is our history in these ways, yeah. to see ourselves reflected. So what I'm saying to you is that as a black person on this territory, we were slaved al enslaved alongside of indigenous peoples on these territories. We can never forget that. Our modern contemporary reality is not the same as the indigenous peoples that are struggling on these territories, but our histories have always been connected and they continue to be connected. Our struggle has always been connected with indigenous peoples and our struggle continues to be connected. That's what reconciliation means for me. That's what land acknowledgement means for me. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, we live in an incredible city. It's a city that I came to about 15 years ago. I grew up in Oshawa, down the lake. I watched the Raptors growing up. I watched Vince, and that got me into basketball and got me into wanting to see if I could, how could I get down here? How could I sneak out to Toronto? I, I loved the Blue Jays as well when I was a kid growing up. And um, I loved the culture. I loved the food markets. I loved the fact that there were other people from Sierra Leone in Toronto, because we're hard to find. Um, when I moved here at about 21 years of age, I thought that the kinds of discrimination that I experienced growing up in an almost all-white town, I didn't think that those things would be here. I was wrong, of course. Um, we know that story already. But what I want to talk about is the fact that as a union, as unionized workers, as people who, uh, whose purpose is to come together for a common cause, to engage in solidarity work, to lift up people who may not have the same experiences and opportunities, to create those opportunities for other people. My message to you today is obviously that we have a lot of work to do, yeah. Yeah. and we know that. And it can be done inside of your union shop. It can be done inside the places where you work. It actually has to be done yes, yes. in those places. Sometimes you guys might see me in the street. Sometimes you might see me getting myself confronted by the police, shouting in a rally, facing up a police line. That's one part of the work, but not everybody can do that work. I want to acknowledge that. That's not what activism means to me. That's not the only way that people can contribute to our liberation, our collective liberation as black people, is to do it in those very visible ways. Very high risk ways, I should add. Not everybody can do that. But we all have a role that we can play. And so I do want to talk about solidarity. Because if you're not that person who's on the front line of a demonstration, if you're not the person who is on the telephone making phone calls for somebody in your community who's vulnerable and needs help, what can you do though? The places where we work are the places that are the most important places to organize because that's where we spend so much of our time. I don't expect people to go outside of their experience and try to go looking for a place to engage in liberation work. You can do it wherever you are, because the work is right in front of you. Let's talk about shelters, because somebody mentioned the shelter system. I have a radio show every Sunday, and a couple of Sundays ago, I talked about an experience with another city service, the TTC. 
I was assaulted on the TTC. I was assaulted by a woman twice my age on the TTC. A white woman who thought it was funny that she knew that she could hit me and get away with it. So I had my back turned. There's like, you know, there's a lot of people in this room, but you can fit a lot of people on a streetcar. Yeah. So there are more people on the streetcar than there are in this room. Yeah. It was Saturday night. You know what I mean? Everybody was going where they were going. It was loud. People are laughing. People are having a great time. I was chatting on the phone to somebody, and I felt this, like, shot from behind. <laughs> and I had seen the person who sat behind me. It was a little old lady. And I thought that, you know, she has a bag. So she's probably sat down and swung around with her bag and it just smacked me. No big deal. That's not important. I kept going with my talk on the phone. But about 20 seconds later, I felt it again, like <laughs> harder this time. So now I knew something was wrong. And I turned around and this woman was like, Seventy years old, no shame. No shame to put your hands on a black person minding their own business. Seventy or seventy-five year old woman? Why? So I turned around and I said, did you just put your hands on me? Why did you touch me? I was so upset. This woman said, I can hear your conversation. <laughs> My conversation? My, just me, huh? Yeah. In this crowded place, just me, you can hear. And you thought that that gave you the right to put your hands on me. Cool. So, again, don't be like me. Not everybody could be like me, and I don't recommend it. I got up out of my seat, because I don't, I don't deal with these kind of things sitting down, literally. And I went, and I took a picture of this woman as she was laughing at me, laughing in my face after she assaulted me two times. Laughing. And I posted her face on the internet and I said, look, black people can't even ride the transit system without being harassed. And in this case, by somebody who nobody would think is gonna be engaging in that kind of behavior, but she knew she could get away with it, y'all. And that's why she did it to me. I shared that experience on the radio a couple of Sundays ago, and quite a miraculous thing happened. A woman called in, and she said, Desmond, my son, I know you're not lying. And the reason I know you're not lying is because it happens to me. This was an older black woman. I could hear the Ghanaian accent in her voice. Because we recognize our people, you know, from West Africa. So you hear that and you're like, okay, that's my auntie. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm calling you from a shelter. Mm -hmm. She said, I've been hit. I've been bullied. I've been abused. People who work here, they see it. They don't help me. They don't say anything. And some of them are actually complicit in what's been going on to me. The courage, the courage. She was in the place calling me, live on the radio between four and five, in the place just calling me on the phone, hoping that I was gonna answer. And she said, my son, I know you're not lying because that's how they do it to me. And they've laughed at me, so I know you're telling the truth. And it was like God like, brought rain, just rain and cleansed my body, like everything. How could this woman be calling to console me for what she was going through. But she recognized the truth of my experience and she wanted to speak out about her own experience. That's a black woman who I've now met, a black woman who I know has a disability, a black woman who has a very hard time physically getting around that people are picking on in a city shelter. When I say that the work and the organizing begins where we are every day, I'm not just trying to make a metaphor. We have to watch out for that sister and for every black woman who's in a vulnerable position like that using a city service. Because we know what can happen when people turn their backs, particularly on black women in our communities. We know what can happen and we know the kind of abuses. So I was so grateful 
for this woman's courage and her strength in telling that story. But we have to make sure that stories like that are not happening. But we do also have an opportunity to organize with and for the people that we're serving every day. We have recreation programs, as you well know, that are means tested for income for you to get a bit of a subsidy, right? So people who are po already poor, many of whom are black, have to disclose 50,000 things about themselves just to get a little bit of a chance at a discount, just to try and get a spot for recreation for the children. We have to do better. We just heard that the city of Toronto's police force, the police force which controls a budget that is already over a billion dollars, that they're going to get an 11.5% raise over the next four years. That's not bad. I would like that. A lot of us would probably appreciate that kind of a raise given how expensive things have gotten in the city of Toronto. How, more, how expensive rent has gotten in the city of Toronto. I'm a renter. A lot of us would like that. But we're not getting that. But our police force, there's an endless pool of money for policing services. But the policing, y'all, it contributes to so many other pro It contributes, I'm gonna say it, it causes more problems. Our policing budget and the associated activities with the police than it is solving. I'm sorry to say that if it makes people feel uncomfortable, but then I'm not really sorry to say it. Because what I'm sorry about is when I get a phone call from somebody in Toronto Community Housing where they want to add 300 more TTC, uh, 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 or TTC, 300 more TCHC cops to the mix. Because there isn't enough policing. You guys think about this, that TCHC is the most police place in the city of Toronto. Obviously, we know that. But they keep telling us that a few more cops and the, the drugs and the gangs and the problems will go away. And we just give them the money. But then I get a phone call from a young man who lives in a TCHC building, who was minding his own business, who got in an elevator with police who were there for something else, and they beat him down. And they broke his shoulder and he had to go to the hospital on Christmas Eve. I was at home on Christmas Eve talking to his mom on the phone Christmas Eve to make sure that somebody could go to the hospital with them. We have to fight these issues where we live and where we work every day. Yes. And when we fight, when we get together, when we raise our voices, particularly for the most vulnerable people in our community, let me tell you what happens and what I see happening. Because I have some wonderful news to end on for you this evening. In 2017, there was a woman in Toronto named Beverly Brom. Some of you know that story already. Yes. Beverly came here from Jamaica, and she did what a lot of people do. She got a work permit, and then her work permit expired. And then she didn't go home. You know, I meet white people in this city and in this country who are like, oh yeah, and then I came up from Atlanta, and my work permit expired, but we just fell in love, and we got married, and the rest is history. But for Beverly, it was an emergency that we had to get Beverly out of the country. So the Canadian Border Services Agency came and swooped in and they apprehended Beverly. The first time they did that, she was pregnant. She was more than seven months pregnant. And the evil that is Canadian Border Services Agency said they're gonna put her on a plane anyway. Her doctor said she wasn't well enough to fly and really who puts a woman in distress on a plane at that time in her life anyhow, in that stage of a pregnancy? What kind of evil is this? Y'all, 30 or 40 or 50 or 60,000 people, we don't even know the number, came over from the United States during Vietnam. Nobody asked them for their work permit. They were just allowed to walk into the country because they were mostly white, educated, draft dodgers. They were not black people from Jamaica who are only good enough to come here and pick the fruit and then get sent back home. Yeah. Those people got to stay and they weren't even documented, but for us, they have a number for every one of us. Absolutely. They apprehended Beverly and they threatened to deport her while pregnant, but because of the advocacy of Black Lives Matter Toronto, yep. 
They forestalled that deportation. <coughs> Beverly had her baby. We thought everything maybe was going to cool down. She was apprehended again, and this time they apprehended her with her child. Her child was in a detention center with her. What kind of people apprehend a baby? The baby is a Canadian citizen. So when she claimed, what are you doing? They said, well, your baby can go. Your baby's free to go whenever it wants. This is the country we're living in. People organized. People called the Minister of Public Safety, the Minister of Immigration. People called their local media and said, this is not right. People told their own stories of immigration and people said, this woman is a gift. Her child is a gift to this country. Why are we trying to get rid of them? And finally, the government backed down and just about two days ago, Black Lives Matter Toronto announced publicly that Beverly Brown has been granted permanent residency in this country. And that is a great story that people made happen by coming together and by organizing for somebody who a lot of people are told not to organize for, who a lot of us are warned against, well, those are the people who didn't play by the rules, or you know how people talk, you know the way that Black people, we are divided. There's the good black people and then there's the not so good. I don't go down for that. I'm not in for that. I'm not in for that. When a black person in our community has their life taken from them by the police and they say, but that person was a troublemaker, I still call out their name on the radio because that's still my brother and my sister. Okay? And so, what I want to say is that when we were organizing for Beverly after she had her baby, and she and her Canadian-born husband, because people think that just because you're married to a Canadian, you automatically get to stay in Canada. Not the case. I wish it was, right? They did a press conference in the middle of Young, Dun or, uh, middle of Young and Bloor, in the middle of the intersection. The, you know how they got into the middle of the intersection? Dozens of us came and blocked the intersection with our bodies and let them come in with a table and chairs and a podium. And the media all came into the middle. And yeah, it was early in the morning one weekday and people were leaning on the horns. They could have turned around, but they wanted to tell us how angry they were at us that we were doing this. How dare you? But it was for Beverly. It was for that child. It was for the sake of not breaking up another black family, which our government has done too many times. We had to put ourselves on the line. But you know what? For every person who went out into that intersection, there was somebody who made a phone call. There was somebody who made a donation. There was somebody who sent an email. There was somebody who accompanied Beverly to an appointment. We all have a role to play, whether it's a visible role or a role that maybe nobody ever sees. But we have to be in solidarity with the cause. That's what I'm asking from you today. We might not all engage in the same way, but let's remember that people like Beverly, immigrants, particularly immigrants, black immigrants in this country that may not speak English as a first language. I talked about the farm workers who come here and pick our fruit. Some of the most exploited people in this country. If we're, as union people, not organizing for them, who are we organizing for? Because when we lift up those workers, the whole floor comes up for every laborer in this province. Those are the kind of things that we have to do. When we advocate for the better shelter system in this city, and a shelter is a stopgap, because what we really need is housing. Okay? But we have to have some dignity for people like the woman who called into my radio show in the meantime. We have to restore people's dignity. And so we do have to fight for a better system. And when we fight so that people are not left languaging in the streets or in substandard shelter conditions, we're lifting the bar up for everyone in the city of Toronto. When we fight for actual supports in our community centers and in our public housing instead of just more policing and security, we're lifting everybody in our community up. We have to be in solidarity with the people, the black people in our communities who are at the most risk. And if we're not going to be out there in the street blocking the intersection, 
I hope we're going to be the person who makes the donation. I hope we're going to be the person that calls and tells somebody, hey, maybe send a letter if you have five minutes for this. I hope we're going to be the person that says, you know what? Next time the people who organize that thing have an event, let me go and help and volunteer for it. We all have a role to play, and we see the austerity. We see the way that the leadership of this city right now, again, wants to have a budget that shortcuts everybody, except the police. And we have to organize from the bottom up. That's the message that I want to leave with you, which is to say that we might not all fight the same way, and that's okay. But what are our values? What are we in solidarity with? Who are we trying to lift up? That's the message that I want to leave you with and have you think about. I know I'm standing between you and the food, so <laughs> I just want to say again, thank you to Aveline, thank you to the organizers, thank you to all of you for listening. And as Asada Shakur said, you know what she said, I hope. She said, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and care for one another. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Right.